newspaper accounts of Prince inherited leadership of the Supreme Team in 1987 when his uncle, Supreme, went to prison. After being acquitted in state court for numerous homicides, he emerged to much fanfare in the streets. He was the undisputed street boss of Supreme Team, and he had the makings of an army under him. Prince solidified his control of the team by increasing the security force and employing it against team members suspected of disloyalty. His philosophy was, get down or lay down, and he kept it close to home. Baisley Projects, the Supreme Team member says, that was headquarters. The Supreme Team held it down in the projects. It was their own personal fife dome to rule like feudal lords and control how they saw fit. With the crack wars in full swing, Prince and his crew terrorized the streets with a vengeance and continued to carve their niche and perpetuate their legend. The team was run like a crime family that rivaled the old style mob crews. There were certain protocols and procedures to follow as well as a hierarchy to uphold. Prince had two rules, do what he said and don't snitch. There wasn't much more to it than that. Dudes who stood strong and held their tongues were rewarded. Those who didn't suffered the team's retribution. In the streets, Prince was a fearsome figure. His wrath was an absolute and it was legendary. And law enforcement was hot on his trail, trying to get team members to turn on their leader. Niggas weren't snitching on Prince, the Queen's hustler says. They was scared. But that didn't stop dudes from gunning for him. Prince had enemies, lots of them. Some even within the ranks of the team. Legend has it, Prince engaged in gunfighter type duels and laid down the law with rapid fire submachine guns. The security team did drive-bys and peppered enemies with bullets. They practiced the art of street warfare with Sun Tzu flair. Law enforcement and federal officials considered Prince one of the most violent drug dealers in the city during the 1980s. Prince was the most intimidating individual in the south side of Jamaica, Queens, Bing says. Wasn't no one trying to cross him. New York's tabloid newspapers called Prince Mr. Untouchable. He was like the Teflon Don, John Gotti, as nothing would stick. Cases would be brought and Prince would end up walking. The indictments were thrown out. In and out on murder charges, he beat them all. His cunning in the streets was backed up by his legal shrewdness. His leadership outlook consisted of doing me and to hell with the consequences. When Prince took over the Supreme Team, he ratcheted up the violence. Collateral damage be damned. Residents of the 113th and 103rd precincts who hoped that Supreme's incarceration would lead to the demise of the team were in for a surprise. With Prince back in control, violence was as much a part of life as trips to the shops along Jamaica Avenue were. The police were nothing to us, Bing says. We didn't give a fuck about them. On the South Side, there was that overwhelming attitude. They were like, NWA, fuck the police. In his book, from pieces to wait, 50 Cent wrote about Prince and his reputation. 50 called him King in the book. King was, in a word, notorious. He had previously been an enforcer for the organization, but the feds had indicted the leaders of his crew a few months before. The old bosses still ran things from the pen, but King was left in charge of the street operations while his boss's lawyers scouted the law encyclopedias for appeal loopholes. King's rep was built on disappearing Colombian connections, tortured workers, and public murders. People who were set to testify against him usually changed their minds, couldn't remember what exactly happened, or claimed that the police misunderstood their statements. Word was that King even took the life of his best friend over a few thousand dollars that went missing.